So we're going to close this this little section I've been doing on Jesus tonight. And so I don't know if this is going to be too much or not enough, quite honestly. Um, I, I increasingly find that, um, especially in, in the day in which we live, because of so many things we hear in the media about Christianity and about the person of Jesus, that we often have... We're made to feel um, like we're somehow just kind of stupid if you believe in Jesus. You know, so I might have mentioned this once before, but I think, um, I think by and large, the, um, the culture that we live in, gross generalization, but I, I experience it personally, and, and I'm sure some of you do too, it tends to um, categorize people into, into two different categories. There are, on this side, there are people who are intelligent, who went to college at 14, Right, or <laughs> like, wow! No wonder you're a doctor. So, go to college at 14. So they're intelligent, they're reasonable, they're intellectual, they're logical, they're sane. And then there's people with faith, and they're unintelligent, and they're unreasonable, and they believe myths and superstitions, and their gullibles all get out. And um, we want to just explode that, quite honestly. Um, I will argue again and again and again um, that faith is not blind. Faith rests on very solid reasons. I can't convince you to believe, we'll, we'll talk about that at the very ending tonight, because that's not an intellectual objection, that's actually a, an objection of the will. Um, but we want to continue to look at the person of Jesus and, and, um, and see the data for him so we want to look at him. We want to look in a particular way at the New Testament and other sources, other ancient sources who talk about Jesus. And then, like I said with Tiffany's comment, I want to talk um, a little bit about how the early church grew. Okay, that's what we're going to do tonight. So there are going to be a lot of quotes, and I'm going to have them all up here. So I just encourage you to follow along. The first half of this is pretty much just um, a selection of um, people's comments so you're not just hearing me that I find to be particularly provocative. The first comes from a guy named Luke Timothy Johnson. Um, an excellent book that came out about, uh, I don't know, 18 years ago maybe now called The Real Jesus. This is, this is what he says. He says, as I've tried to show, the character of the gospel narratives does not allow a fully satisfying historical reconstruction of Jesus' ministry. Nevertheless, Certain fundamental points on which all the Gospels agree, when taken together with confirming lines of convergence from outsider testimony, so non-Christian sources, and non-narrative New Testament evidence, can be regarded as historical with a high degree of probability. Even the most critical historian can confidently assert that a Jew, note that, even the most critical historian can confidently assert that a Jew named Jesus worked as a teacher and wonder worker in Palestine during the reign of Tiberius, he's the emperor, was executed by crucifixion under the prefect Pontius Pilate. We have archaeological data for Pontius Pilate. And continued to have followers after his death. These assertions are not mathematically or metaphysically certain, for certainty is not within the reach of history. That's a huge point. We asked that last week. How do you verify history? You don't do it scientifically. But they enjoy a high level of probability. Still, other assertions can be made with only slightly less probability that Jesus' mission was among his fellow Jews, for example, and that some Jews were involved in his death, or that Jesus initiated some sort of movement within Judaism by the gathering of followers. A reminder of what we mean by historical probability is appropriate here. The term refers to the degree of confidence we can have in the state of knowledge. It does not adjudicate the reality of an occurrence or an event 
but only what we can know of an occurrence or event. Historical probability rests upon the ability to verify statements by means of evidence or logic. Okay, so we're, we're looking at all this right now. The reason I'm, I'm going to walk through some of these quotes is last week we looked at the claims of Jesus and we argued um, using C.S. Lewis's argument that Jesus because he claims to be God is either Lord or he's liar or he's a lunatic because he's claiming to be God. He either is what he says he is or he's not what he says he is and he knows it, which means he's a liar. He's not a good man. Or he thinks he is, but he's not, which means he's nuts. Okay. But other people have put forth the idea, especially in the last couple of years, decades maybe, that there's a fourth option. And the fourth option is maybe he's just a legend. Like maybe he just lived and like somehow this idea of him being divine, like that's just a much later idea that crept in among his followers somehow for some reason. They thought that this man who was butchered in a horrific way, uh, he's somehow alive. I don't know how, but he's alive. And we just want to continue to promote his cause somehow. And so the idea that he's divine is much later. It doesn't belong to the New Testament. It doesn't belong to the era of the time that he lived. Okay? So we want to show that that's just um, illogical and unreasonable when you look at the evidence uh, and the data. So Johnson goes on to say, thus, I personally hold everything I've just stated about Jesus in those comments we saw above, to be certain in the sense that I am huge here, intellectually convinced that these assertions correspond to reality. So we, we often hear, and I, I, I berate this a lot or I go over this a lot just because uh, I am tired of the claim that Christians somehow just close their eyes and believe in the absence of evidence. It's absurd. It's not being intellectually honest with the data that we have. But as a historian, I can only state them as more or less probable on the basis of evidence available for verification. Still Johnson. So these are now, this has to do, with, that had to do with what we know from Christian sources uh, in the New Testament itself, what we can gather together. The earliest outsider reports, so non-Christians, right? In some case, like downright really anti-Christian. The earliest outsider reports contain considerable divergence, but there are also points of convergence. There is the appearance of the title Christos as a virtual name. So Josephus, he's a Jewish historian. Suetonius is a, a Roman author. Tacitus is a Roman historian. Pliny is uh, a governor. So from them, between being pagan Romans or uh, Jews, we get the, the common idea that uh, Christ is a title and it's a virtual name for him. His location in Palestine or Judea, we get that from Josephus, again, the Jewish historian. The Babylonian Talmud, which is a series of um, writings, uh, Jewish writings, um, some centuries after Jesus, but still early. Tacitus, Lucian of Samosota, who is a tremendously um, uh, satirist, um, who wrote scathing things about Christians. Uh, his death by execution, again, the same sources, and the continued presence of a movement carrying his name. So these are all early, outsider, non-Christian sources from which we can get this agreement on these ideas, okay? Less well attested, but still present, is the placement of his death under Pontius Pilate. So... Tacitus, the Roman historian, Josephus, the Jewish historian, both identify that. Or Tiberius, Tacitus talks about that. And the involvement of Jewish leaders in his death from two Jewish sources. In terms of Jesus' activities before his death, the only points of convergence are that he worked wonders. So these are Jewish non-Christian sources that talk about that, and that he was a teacher. Same thing, Jewish non-Christian sources. Of equal importance to this positive evidence is what these sources do not say about Jesus and his movement. This is significant because it's become kind of fashionable in the last um, uh, 30, 40, 50 years, maybe longer than that too, to say that Jesus was really like some political revolutionary. That's what he was. 
this whole idea that he thought he was God, is, no, he just missed the point. So equal importance is the positive evidence to what these sources do not say about Jesus and his movement. There is no trace of evidence that either he or the movement associated with him was identified as a political or military movement. So that's Johnson just talking about what we have in uh, both New Testament and then outside non-Christian sources with uh, the person of Jesus and his death his ministry. What about his resurrection? Here's some choice quotes from Johnson. So the resurrection is not a claim that Jesus was resuscitated, that he resumed his former life after a clinical death experience, like a near-death experience. Huh? Such resuscitations are well documented both in ancient literature and today, right? So we, we read all these, you know, like I had a friend of mine who died on the operating table, had a tremendous experience of light and warmth and love, and, and he's alive now. And, like, hooray for him, but it doesn't do anything for me, right? It didn't change my life. Changed his, to be sure, all right, but it doesn't impact me. So the ancient world knew these things, too. They had people who had these kinds of experience. As Johnson goes on to say, a resuscitation is excellent news for the patient and the family. It's not good news that affects everybody else. It doesn't begin a religion. It doesn't transform the lives of others across the ages. And it is not what is being claimed by the first Christians. At the very heart of Christianity, Johnson says, therefore, is an experience and a claim. The ex that, those are two really important words here. At the heart of the gospel is both an experience and a claim. The experience is one of transforming, transcendent, personal power within communities. That, that's what you described in seeing in your fiancé, huh? Boyfriend. 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 Sorry. Boyfriend. Maybe I'm getting a vision. <laughs> <laughs> th in fact, I think it's a November wedding. Um, <laughs> 2019. <laughs> He's calling me right now. So, so... Something's changed in these communities, right? It can be expressed in shorthand as, quote-unquote, the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the experience. Like, I can tell you my life used to be this way. I encountered God by the power of the Holy Spirit, and my life is totally different. It's not just news. It's extraordinary news. Like, it, it's equivalent to I used to be blind, and now I can see. That's the experience that people describe, okay? The claim is that this power comes from Jesus, who was crucified, but who now lives by the life of God. Two last quotes from Johnson. The matter is also one of simple logic. For in effect, we need a necessary and sufficient cause. Anyone becoming aware of the drastically reduced number of Jews in Europe in 1945 compared with 1932 could logically posit a cause sufficient to account for that effect. Such reasoning would not necessarily lead to the specific description of the Holocaust. But it would be necessarily lead to some force sufficiently great to accomplish so awesome an effect. Theories of increased tourism would not do. In the case of early Christianity, the explanation of this world religion's birth by a single person's hallucination or vision or realization is simply incommensurate with the explosive character of the movement that within 25 years, under the most trying circumstances, managed to create communities across the Mediterranean world. We're going to look at that a little bit more in depth in a second. So go back to... N.T. Wright's comments from the article I gave us last week. So Wright uh, will make the argument that the only plausible, historically plausible explanation for the spread of the early church, given the circumstances that we're going to look at in a second, to explain Christianity is that the tomb was empty 
and that people saw the risen Jesus bodily a number of times after his resurrection, including people who did not believe in him. Most especially a man named Paul, who was killing his disciples. Okay? Uh, Wright, Wright and Johnson are both great theologians and historians. Um, Wright's work, it's thick, it's dense. That's why I gave the, the link to the, uh, the one video that's worth watching because it's, it's easier to watch a one-hour video than it is to read a thousand-page book for most of us. But here, here's the point in all this. If you want to, what Wright doesn't do, Wright doesn't build straw men. So you know what a straw man is? Y you try to create for the opponent the weakest argument you can possibly come up with, and then you destroy it. Wright takes the best arguments you can come up with for the resurrection. And then he just looks at the data and the evidence. And so again, wh what, what we need to do as we continue to explore whether or not we want to get to a point of surrendering our lives to Jesus, which is what it means to be Catholic. That's the goal of everything we're doing here, is to surrender. In order to do that, that's going to be an act of faith, but faith, because it's not blind, it's going to need something in my intellect to latch on to. Okay? So we want to do the hard work. And I'm just given really... Uh, maybe insufficient, but looks anyway at people who've done some of the hard work and at least steering you towards some of those sources. Okay? So that's, that's Jesus, um, as Johnson talks about him. Um, what about, though, the idea that somehow the New Testament isn't very credible? So it's, uh, it's not uncommon for people to go... And, and maybe even some of us think this way. You know, like the Old Testament's kind of, or the New Testament's old, right? It's 2,000 years old. How can we trust this? Let me show you, um, let me show you one chart, and then I'm going to give you a, a couple of other things as well. So these, these are a series of works which are considered um, trustworthy, reliable sources for um, antiquity. So I'm going to list here a set of folks that maybe we do or do not know, but we could include people like Plato and Aristotle and Homer and a whole set of other people as well. So the idea here is we, on, the, on the left, you're going to see a whole series of authors from ancient times whose works we use today in history. They would be considered as reliable and um, accurate even though they might be written kind of fancifully at times in how they describe history. But, but they're used to, in universities. We're going to look at when they were written. We're going to look at the earliest copy that we have, the time lapse between when they were written and the earliest copy, and then the number of copies that we have. Okay? So Herodotus. So he's writing in the 5th century BC. So it's written somewhere around 488 to 428. The earliest copy that we have is from 900 A.D., Time lapse, we can do the math, 1,300 years, with a whopping eight copies. Okay? Thucydides, say that ten times real fast. <laughs> Thucydides, <laughs> he wrote in the 5th century B.C. too, so, four, <laughs> so rum, somewhere around there. I'll tell you a story one time of a priest friend of mine who was the funniest man I've ever known who had a lisp, and when we preached, we just used to love it. Um, <laughs> so he wrote... Roughly the same time, huh? The earliest copy we got from him is uh, 900, ding, ding, another 1,300 years, and we've got, uh, likewise, eight copies of that. Tacitus, his name's come up a few times already. He's this Roman historian. He's writing at the turn of the 1st and 2nd centuries, so right around the year 100. Earliest copy we have is from 1,100. Getting closer now. So with time lapse of 1,000 years, we got 20 copies of Tacitus's annals, the years of the Roman emperors. Caesar, this is Julius Caesar, Caesar's Gallic Wars. I'm not sure why it's showing up like that. Um, when written, it was written in the uh, first century BC. The earliest copy that we have is from 900, about a 950-year time gap. And we've got somewhere around nine or 10 copies. Livy's Roman history. He writes it somewhere between the middle of the first century and the second century. 
It's also the earliest copy is from 900, roughly a 900 year time gap. And we got 20 copies of that. Um, the New Testament. So the New Testament's written um, in the first century, certainly by the, uh, the we would typically close uh, the canon of the New Testament uh, in the 90s, maybe. The earliest copy that we have um, is from 130. We actually have fragments that would be in the first century of the Gospel of John. It's in uh, a museum in uh, Manchester in England. We have an entire New Testament um, from the fourth century, a time gap of 300 years. So no one would, no one, nobody doubts these, okay? They're all considered to be reliable, accurate, authoritative. Look at the time gap and look at the number of copies that we have. So the New Testament, in Greek, we have 5,000 copies in Greek. We have 10,000 copies in Latin. And we have 9,300 copies in other languages. How do all of a sudden the New Testament becomes historically unreliable? Here's how somebody else puts it. If critics want to disregard the New Testament, then they must also disregard Plato, Aristotle, and Homer. Why? Because the New Testament is better preserved and more numerous than any other ancient writing. Because they are so numerous, they can be cross-checked for accuracy. So in all of these copies of the New Testament that we have, some 24,000 copies of the New Testament, the accuracy between them, when you cross-check them, the similarity is 99.5%. There's nothing that comes close to that. They would say they're textually pure in that regard. So the fragment of the Gospel of John I mentioned is probably within 30 years of the authorship of John. We don't have anything from an ancient writing that gets that close to the original. It's unheard of. So again, you're going to dismiss, if you're going to dismiss the New Testament as being somehow some ancient, unreliable source, then you're throwing out Plato, you're throwing out Aristotle, you're throwing out Homer. And again, to the, the use of reason, right? The Christian has more reasons to trust in the reliability of the New Testament than any person has in any other ancient writing. That's the evidence. That's the data that we have, okay? Yeah. No, so, yeah, good catch. So it's, um, it's 300 years for a complete copy of the New Testament. It's actually within that. So... The first, we, we have a complete New Testament from the early part of the 4th century. So that's a, that's a good catch, actually. The earliest um, copy that we have of an entire writing is 130. But the, but the complete New Testament is uh, the early part of the 4th century. We have, the University of Michigan has, in one of their libraries, one of the oldest copies of the New Testament. You don't ever get in to see it, but it's there, right? Okay. So back to Johnson real quick on this. Because this sets up, again, what um, I want to spend the rest of our time on looking tonight. The only real validation for the claim that Christ is what the creed claims him to be, what we profess every Sunday altogether, light from light, true God from true God, get this, people, is to be found in the quality of life demonstrated by those who make this confession. Only if Christians and Christian communities illustrate lives transformed according to the pattern of faithful obedience and loving service found in Jesus does their claim to live by the Spirit of Jesus have any validity. He goes on to say, the gospel cannot be demonstrated logically. That is to say, I, I can't tell you Jesus is God. I can make an argument for it. 
They cannot be proved historically. They can be validated only existentially, experientially, huh? by the witness of authentic Christian discipleship. Here's the way another author um, puts it, a guy named Richard Bauckham, who teaches in uh, Scotland, I think, at the University of St. Andrews. Therefore, believing testimony, as we do very frequently indeed, entails a fundamental attitude of trust. But not necessarily uncritical trust. When we believe testimony, we believe what is said because we trust the witness. Right? This is one of the things that makes man unique. The human person, right? Your dog doesn't ask questions. Pandas, God bless them, they don't ask questions. We ask questions. Why do we ask questions? We want to know, right? We're the only animal that asks questions. We want to know, and we want to know truth. And as we talked about last week, for most of the things that we kn- for most of the things that we know, we rely on others to tell us, right? We rely on testimony from people, and we believe them because we trust them. This attitude of trust is very fundamental. It's not blind. The child begins with an attitude of complete trust in what it is told and develops more critical attitudes as it matures. Testimony, then, of its very nature invites trust. And, and one of the things that Bauckham talks over and over again in his book, and I've made a copy of um, one of his articles tonight for us, the New Testament authors are telling you I have seen this. They, they are eyewitness. Either they are direct eyewitness testimonies or they are telling you what eyewitnesses told them. Okay? They're inviting you to trust them. Me. We have no reason to think that as a means of knowledge, testimony is less reliable than perception, memory, or inference. We have no reason to suppose that the perceptions of others given us in testimony, are less worthy of belief than our own. When you, when you tell somebody something, you're, you're trying to prevail on them, right? I mean, you're trying to, you should, hopefully your relationship with them is such that they believe you. You want them to believe you. Comprehensive distrust of everything that others tell us defies the communal and intersubjective reality of the human epistemic situation. Uh, epistemology is the study of how we know things. A fundamental attitude of trust is not gullibility. It's a necessary, we could say, a necessary virtue for understanding. You will know next to nothing if you don't believe the testimony of others. That's the whole premise of a teacher, a doctor, a coach. We, we submit ourselves to others because they've shown themselves to be Deserving to help me, you know, get in shape or win a football game or financially plan successfully or learn another language. Like, you don't want me teaching you Sanskrit. We're not going anywhere, right? So we find people who are trustworthy to teach us what it is we want to learn. And the whole point of looking at the data of the New Testament is there are reasons to think the people who are telling me they really saw what they saw really saw what they saw. And if you're not going to believe them, don't believe anything in antiquity. And then where are you? Okay? Now, that said, let's look at this. This to me is a, a huge, huge point. So I want to sh- talk a little bit about how the early church grew. So this is a map of the ancient Roman Empire. What's in white is water. Okay? What's in red is the Roman Empire. That's at the height of the Roman Empire in 117 when Trajan was the emperor. It covers more or less the known world. Right? Up at the top is, you know, so here's, here's England. We got Scotland at the top and Ireland over there. How did this happen? R- anybody been to Rome? Yeah, okay, a few of us. For those of you who haven't, um, so I live there. It's not my favorite city in the world. I actually can't stand it. Um, It's a dumpy town. 
It's humid as all get out. It's riddled with um, mosquitoes. It's m malaria, um, means bad air. Um, they thought that the air in that area is what was killing people. Um, it wasn't the mosquitoes were killing people who came from the Tiber River. Um, it is a really unlikely place to become the center of the world. It has next to no natural resources except for travertine, which is a really porous marble. How did this happen? How did this hut, series of huts, in a dumpy little place by the Tiber River with no natural resources take over the world? I'll tell you how it happened. Soldiers. It happened because of them. It happened because of the Roman Legion, which was the most fearful army in the world. So, in other words, it grew by, by force, it grew by violence, it grew by imposition. It had an agenda, right? The emperor had an agenda. His agenda was to conquer. He had a lust for power, for slaves, and for resources. I'm not sure if this is going to show up or not. Ah, it does. Watch this. So the little white dot, that's Jerusalem. The purple is the growth of the church. We're at 300. <coughs> Look at that. Now we're at 600. How in the world does the church grow? Anybody been to Jerusalem? A few of us. Yeah. Jerusalem, like Rome, really unlikely place for a movement to start. It's a dumpy little hill town. There's nothing there. All right, it's sand, jagged rocks, no natural resources. I, I, I came to understand, I've been there a couple of times, why the Psalms speak so often about water. And when you find an oasis in the desert, it is extraordinary. Like you just jump in because <laughs> there's no water. I know why the Israelites complained in the desert because there's no water. Okay, it's, it's not a place where a movement would start from. And yet from here, starting in the 30s, the church grows like wildfire. And I alluded to this last week, but from the year 64 until the year 312, so 1964, 64. 64 is when the fire of Rome happens. So in July of the year 64, a fire destroys roughly three quarters of the ancient city, which was mostly built out of wood. Um, Nero was the emperor at the time, the pressure um, begins to mount on the Emperor Nero, who was a megalomaniac to the nth. Um, the people of Rome despised him. He understands that the pressure is growing on him, so he tries to find a scapegoat to blame the fire on the scapegoat he picks is the Christians. So he accuses them of starting the fire. In September, October of um, the year 64, he begins the persecutions, the first systematic government persecution of Christians. We know what happens in those persecutions from Tacitus the Roman historian we were looking at earlier. Tacitus describes what happened. So Nero had a series of exhibitions in his circus, which was not like, you know, a big top and all that. It was a racetrack. Think Ben-Hur or Gladiator or whatnot. So the circus is a place where they would have animal exhibitions and games and whatnot. Nero's circus was right next to the Tiber River. It happens to be where St. Peter's built today. We're going to look at that in two weeks. We're going to do a virtual tour of that and find out why St. Peter's is St. Peter's, why it's built there. So Nero um, holds the exhibitions, and in the middle of the exhibitions and games, he starts killing Christians. Tacitus says he killed them in three ways. They sewed them up inside of animal skins alive and then threw them out into the arena where they were torn to shreds by animals. They crucified them. Or, get this, they would tie their hands behind their backs, they would mount them on a pole, cover them in pitch, and then set them on fire, alive, so that Nero's games could go around the clock. 
So they were living lamps. That's what the Roman historian says about what Nero did to the Christians. Nero, from 64 on, from his reign on, there's a law in the Roman books that says it is not licit for a Christian to exist. From 64 till 312, roughly the history of our country, the length, huh? It was illicit for a Christian to exist. That doesn't mean that there were persecutions that went on those whole times. There were four really major persecutions in that 250-year gap. But it was illegal to be a Christian. It was considered an illegal superstition. How in the world does an illegal superstition which is martyred periodically in horrific fashion, grow like that. It certainly doesn't have a sword. We often hear things like Christianity or uh, history is written by the winners. Sometimes that's true. Not for the early Christians it wasn't. <laughs> they didn't win anything. They won death. That's what they won. Horrifically. How does that grow? Well, it also has an agenda. So just, just before looking at the agenda of the early church, just note this. Look, look how far. It started here, and it covers all this. Like, there's no Silver Seas cruise line. Right? There's no Delta Air. You got boats, and you got horses, and you got feet, <laughs> right? Before this, nobody did missions. Like, there's no missionaries of Apollo, or Zeus, or Aphrodite. You might find temples to these people in different places, but no one did mission work. The Christians did. The Christians were compelled at the risk of their lives and in horrific travel to go to all these places to tell people about what it is that God had done in Jesus. And what had he done? He'd become flesh so as to go to war against the tyrant who had held us captive to liberate us from the power of sin and death, to make us right with God, and to give us back our lives by giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit who enables us to live with authority over ourselves, no longer su subject to feelings and desires and whims that just blow with the wind, right? So their agenda, here's their agenda. Remember, Rome's agenda is power. Christian's agenda is freedom, liberation, mercy, and love. They wanted everybody they met to encounter the person that they had encountered who had brought them out of darkness and into light. They wanted to tell people that somebody had done something about death, that somebody had done something about sin, and that we weren't enslaved anymore. They'd experienced it, and they wanted other people to experience it as well. But it didn't just ha so they told people, in other words. But it, it didn't just happen because they told people, right? It primarily happened because of this. Back to Tiffany's comment. It happened because of the witness of their lives. So we tend to hear people, th people today tend to uh, create a caricature of Christianity that it's um, repressive, um, anti-freedom, um, very closed. Uh, history shows nothing like that, certainly not in the early church. There might be Christians who are like that. But the early church, you don't grow if you're repressive. If you're an illegal superstition that's not allowed to exist, you don't grow by being unattractive and repressive and contrary to human dignity and freedom. So th the church grows because of the witness of Christians and the impact that the church made on an entire culture, a pagan culture which was bleak and hopeless and despairing. Remember back to that worldview we looked at early on as we began uh, becoming Catholic. In, in, in the midst of a, of a culture which was riddled with despair, the gospel comes penetrating with a message which is full of hope, all because of what it is that God has done. So 
It's important to use reason, like we were talking about earlier, but you can't become a Christian by the use of your reason alone. You become a Christian because you've met another Christian. That's how. I've seen somebody, their life is so different, I ask them, what do you have given all you've gone through in your life? And the Christian is longing to hear that question. Because you've just opened the door and now I will kick it off the hinge. And I'll tell you, well, here's what I have. I don't have intellect. I have someone that I've met who I would like you to meet. I can introduce you to him if you would like. His name is Jesus. And he's Lord. So you can't think your way into faith as significant as it is. So Christianity isn't first and foremost a matter of intellectual debate. The church grows, and it it grew then, it continues to grow, when people see radically different lives. So much so that, here's one of my favorite expressions in the Acts of the Apostles, this is what they accuse the Christians of doing in the early church. These men, these Christians, they've come in here and they have turned the world upside down. That's what it means to be a Christian, to turn the world upside down with the hope that can only come from understanding what it is that God's done for us. So let me me talk about three um, quick things to demonstrate this. So the, the early church radically transformed the culture it was in a part of by touching daily life with the power of the gospel. It made it more human, not less human, more human. The exact opposite of how Christianity tends to be characterized today. So here's here's three quick ways. Um, First, it happened because Jews and Gentiles, um, who absolutely hated each other, became friends. So this is hard for us to get because we're Americans, most of us, and like there's no pure blood American unless you're Native American, and even then, we're all from different tribes, right? So. My Ancestry.com thing, it looks like a rainbow. There's like 10,000 different nationalities in there. But for the Jews, uh -uh. I'm Jewish, and you guard that with everything you have, and you do not socialize with, eat with, hang out with, go into the house of anybody who's not a Jew. This is what the, um, the Jewish people used to say. This is from an ancient writing about the relationship between Jews and non Jews, Gentiles. This is a command separate yourself from the Gentiles. Do not eat with them. Do not perform deeds like theirs. Do not become associates of theirs because their deeds are defiled and all their ways are contaminated, despicable, and abominable. That's lovely, huh? And yet, despite that, from almost the beginning of the church, Jews and Gentiles look at each other and call each other brother and sister. How does that happen? Second, um, for those of you who might know the New Testament a little bit, or for those of you who've gone to church here or anywhere else, one of the things that you see when you go to church is you see a collection, right? And it makes us think, like, oh, these people, all, they, all these people want is money. So um, we get used to seeing collections. The New Testament three times talk, talks about a collection being taken up. A collection being taken up by people who lived in one country for people who lived in another country who were not related to them. This is unheard of. Nobody did this in the ancient world. I mean, nobody did this in the ancient world. There's no philanthropy. You know, you're in a place where there's good crops and good rain and you you're, you got good resources, good for you. You live over there, man, stinks to be you, doesn't it? Sorry about that. <laughs> you ain't getting what I got. There's no grocery stores. There's, you, don't, you don't have a means to preserve things the way we do today. Nobody took up collections for unrelated people in other parts of the world. Christians did. Why? Because they came to understand, that's my family. We just don't happen to live in the same place. I might not even know who you are, but you're my family. And you're suffering, 
and I got enough. So here, have some of what I don't need. Right? Nobody did this. Third and most significant in my mind. There's a, um, oh, remember his name? Rodney Starks. There's a great uh, sociologist who has a book called The Rise of Christianity. Starks is not a Catholic. Good, good researcher. He would argue that there's one factor more than any other factor sociologically for the growth of the early church in the first few centuries. It's this. That's not the narrative we hear. Women ran to the early church. In the pagan world, the head of the household was known as the pater familias. Huh? The pater familias had many mistresses, oftentimes, who all had children. It was routine for him in the course of the year to have his mistresses sit on the ground with her children, his children, in front of them, and he would walk through the line and he would go, you can live and you can live. And the rest of them were exposed on the roadways. That was normalcy. Ancient Roman Empire didn't just practice abortion, it practiced infanticide. It would throw children out on the roads. Women had next to no dignity in the ancient world. There's no equality between men and women. All the great philosophers thought that women was intellectually inferior to man and that she was, as a partner, um, emotionally inferior to the man. The man would obviously want another man who had been educated. Women weren't educated, except in very rare circumstances. They were regularly shared by Roman husbands. Somehow, in the midst of that culture, comes the gospel of Jesus. With men preaching and women preaching, no, 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 that's not true, folks. We are very different from one another, to be sure. But we are absolutely equal in dignity. And we are both created in the image and likeness of God. And we are both worth dying for. And we are both called to friendship. And we are both called sons or daughters, beloved children of our Father in heaven. You are not inferior in any way. We're just different. That was the message of the gospel. And marriage is sacred. It's an icon, an image, a sacrament of the relationship that Jesus has with all of us, his bride, the church. Therefore, it is to be kept guarded, esteemed, cherished, seen as holy, because it's a mirror, at least it's supposed to be. You look at it and you see an image of what it means for Jesus to love his church. That was non-existent in the ancient world. And that one factor is how the church grew like crazy. Here's, here's the problem right now. So t- one last thing and then uh, one issue that we're dealing with now and then let me make a conclusion. So what we're, you know, Joe, not intending to be funny, really our question to those who've joined us is like, why in the world are you here now? Like, do you read the news? Have you seen what's going on? What's getting exposed? So we're living in a time uh, of some serious and horrific scandals, a whole host of them on a bunch of different levels. Scandal in the modern world, scandal means something like, oh, that's so disgusting, I can't believe it. And then you look at it again. All right, A scandal in a theological sense, in a Christian sense, doesn't mean, oh, how sick or how horrific. A scandal literally means something that causes you to trip. It's a stumbling block. So if, if John there, if John's the Lord, feel good about yourself for a moment. Last, last week, I was the Lord. Remember, tell him you know me, and you'll be all right. So if he's the Lord, and I, I'm, you and I, we're all created to have a friendship with the Father through Jesus by the power of the Spirit. That's why I was made, okay? That's the end for which every human person exists. So the goal of my life is to know him, and then through him to come to know the Father, all right, by the power of the Spirit. So I'm on my way to him. On my way to him, I see or I meet these people who have done these things, and it causes me to trip, 
And suddenly I go, uh, I don't think so. And I start walking this way. Right? You walk away. So you've seen some people walk away from the church because of the scandalous behavior that is the behavior that's caused people to trip. And the reason why it's so bad is that it keeps people potentially from reaching the end for which they were made. Here's how I, I don't, not to get lost in what's going on, here's the thing. So most people here, you're never going to meet a bishop. But you, you've, meet, you've met each other. You're meeting me. And every day we meet somebody, if we are Christians, we have an opportunity either to help them come to know the Lord or to be a stumbling block for them. Goodness knows the witness of my life has far too often been a stumbling block, but so is yours, quite honestly, right? <laughs> like, there ain't anybody in here who's a saint yet. Please, God, we're aspiring to it, though. But we have on a daily basis an opportunity to lead people to Jesus. The way a friend of mine would always try to prove this, if you will, he'd just say, does anybody here know the name of the Bishop of Calcutta? Nobody, right? Anybody here heard of Mother Teresa? Who do you think had a bigger impact? Mother Teresa or the unnamed, unknown Bishop of Calcutta? I'm going with Mother Teresa, right? So yes, the behavior that we're seeing right now is scandalous and it's causing people to trip. In the meantime, though, they're meeting you and they're meeting me. And what a beautiful comment that you made about what you've found here. Unfortunately, trust me, you won't always find it warm and friendly. Because <laughs> um, I'm not always warm and friendly, I know that. Um, but but what a th that's the testimony, right? That, that's what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to live our lives in such a way that people go, something's different there. Not because we got it all together. Actually, to the contrary, because we acknowledge we actually are so utterly dependent on Jesus that we're just constantly on our knees asking him to somehow use us because we know it can't possibly be us. And hopefully that happens. So we've looked at a lot of things uh, over these first few weeks. Um, We've looked at the kerygma, we've looked at the explosive meshes that is the gospel, we've looked at the person of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, or the claims to it. Tonight we've looked at how the early church spread kind of quickly, but we've looked at it in the middle of a, a, a time when it was an illegal superstition. Here, here's what we have to do now. This is the tough part. So I can use my mind so far, or I can only get so far with my mind. But the decision to believe, because belief doesn't mean to intellectually assent to the idea that God is real. To believe means to get up your hand, put up your hands and to surrender. That is not an intellectual position or an intellectual decision. You need reasons to trust that the person you're surrendering to is worth surrendering to, right? That's, that's why you marry somebody, presumably. Because I think there are reasons to trust that you will care for me and that we will love each other. Here's how, uh, here's how one author, where's that Petri book? So one of the copies I made here, I'll close with this. It's a great book called The Case for Jesus. Here's how he ends it. He says, I can give you all the historical arguments for how we got the Gospels, all the reasons we should believe they go back to the apostles and their disciples. I can give you all the historical evidence for concluding that Jesus of Nazareth claimed to be the long-awaited Jewish Messiah the heavenly son of man, and the divine son of God. I can do all these things, but there's one thing I can't do. I can't answer the ultimate question, the question of whether or not Jesus of Nazareth was in fact God. That's a question you have to answer for yourself. And I have to answer for myself. And to be a disciple of Jesus, to be a Christian, doesn't mean it's a place that I have a place where I go to church on Sundays. It doesn't mean simply that I hand on some rules or regulations to my children. It doesn't mean that I belong to some club. To be a Christian, to be a Catholic, to be a disciple means I have surrendered my life 
to God. And those of us who are here accompanying those of you who are discerning whether or not to do that will argue that there's no greater thing, more worthwhile thing you can do with your life than to make that decision. Okay? I ended that perfectly. We've got time for like one question. <laughs> it's 10 after 8. Um, so we, we, we can take a couple minutes for questions if you'd like. Um, rather than go into tables tonight, we just thought it might be worth getting some feedback on this, seeing how... If what, what's not making sense? What is making sense? What does this provoke? Are there any more cookies? <laughs> Roger ate them all. Yeah. Um, what about the other books that were not included in the New Testament? Okay. Yeah, what about the other books that were not included in the New Testament? You know, that the the, uh, was it the bishops of 1325 accepted certain things, Martin Luther, John, and so on, but it excluded others, the no, heretics, so more or less. So the, the, and why? The, the criteria for a book being, so the canon of the New Testament is closed really in the fourth century. Okay? So by that time, we have, we know what is the New Testament. It's, it's used in the same way everywhere, um, almost without exception. The criteria for it are um, a number of things. Um, apostolic origins, used in, in primarily apostolic origins, used in worship. So it's used as part of their liturgies, had been from the beginning. Um, and orthodoxy. When you read, so it's not uncommon to like, ooh, the lost gospel of Judas was found. Ooh, well, the, it wasn't lost. Like, the ancient world knew about this. If you've ever read any of what we call the Gnostic Gospels, they don't look anything like the Gospels. They don't look anything like history. Jesus doesn't leave footprints. His conversations are bizarre. They're esoteric. It's all about knowledge. Um, at one point in one of the Gnostic Gospels, I think it's the Gospel of Thomas, Jesus says, unless you become a man, you shall never enter into the kingdom. Cool. All right. Sorry, ladies. Um, he says that to Mary Magdalene. So th the, the, the those texts which are not included in the New Testament don't have any of the orthodoxy, don't have any of um, the apostolic origins, and don't have um, use in the early church in a universal kind of way. So big question. Uh, in, in short answer, disciple is a, disciple means a, a student, right, more than anything. Um, apostles are, in a particular way, witnesses of the resurrection. Paul is a witness of the resurrection. He's encountered the risen Jesus. There's a lot more that could be said, but that's sufficient probably for right now. Yeah. How about those who are discerning coming in? It, this is such an awkward place, right? We're all looking at you like, do you guys got any questions? <laughs> <laughs> hey, dum-dums, you got any? Is this making sense? <laughs> like, say something silly so we can all, like, nobody here knows what they're talking about for everything, including me, so don't worry. Um, but those discerning, is this, just, do you get where we are? Is this making sense? Yeah? Okay. What we want to do next then, so next week we're going to, uh, as Joe said, we're going to be upstairs. We're going to be in the church. We're going to celebrate the Feast of All Saints. Um, and then the following week, we'll link these two things together. The following week, we're going to do this virtual tour of St. Peter's. And one of the things that we're going to see when we do the virtual tour of St. Peter's is that the tradition of um, praying to the saints or talking to the saints, asking, both talking to them and asking their intercession for the dead goes back to the very beginning of the church. We know that because we have graffiti all over the place going back to the second and the third century right next to Peter's grave, which we're going to see virtually as we kind of walk through that. So what we're going to do next week at Mass which for some of us, because of the traditions that we come from, we were just taught like, oh, that's pagan. We don't do that. We don't, we don't talk to saints. We don't have saints. We don't pray for the dead. We don't do any of those kinds of things. So some of us came from a tradition like that. I'm very mindful of that. Well, the early church, we know this because you can see it. They did that. We want to understand it properly and understand why it's not worshiping someone other than God. Um, but the early church did that. They talked to the, to the saints because they weren't dead. 
They were in heaven. And they asked the saints to pray for those who were not yet in heaven, but who had already died. Okay? So that's what we're going to do these next two weeks.